Welcome everybody to season two of the podcast. In season one, we covered seven things. Giving and what it should look like, tithing and whether or not it's biblical, how to read and interpret the Bible, what does true Christian judgment look like, is once saved, always saved true in the doctrine of true and false conversion, easy believism and free grace theology, How Should Christians Pray was the last episode we covered. Now, in this season of the podcast, we're going to focus on false teachings and heresies of the modern world. But before we even start dealing with these things themselves, we have to establish what do we even mean when we're referring to false teachers and heresies. We have to define the terms so that we can use them appropriately. There really is almost an endless sum of false teachings and false teachers out there. So it really makes sense to start with what will be the basis of our second season of the podcast, defining exactly what a heresy or a false teacher is so that we can appropriately deal with the range of things out there in the modern world. Now, a necessary podcast to listen to either before this or after this would be our teaching on how to interpret the Bible. Now, that is in episode three of season one. You need to know how to properly interpret the Bible in order to deal with any of these false teachings or heresies out there that we will discuss in this season, as if we don't agree upon the biblical rules of interpretation, you can easily make any scripture mean anything you want by twisting the words. I have seen many false teachers do this when speaking of things that they really know nothing about. I saw this recently when I was researching another topic uh, where someone was saying that in Matthew 5.28, the word for lusting after a woman, the word woman there, which is gune, doesn't mean any woman. It just means a married woman. That, of course, is not true. It means any woman of age. So when Jesus says, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart, he is telling the truth. It's not when you're just looking at, oh, I can lust all I want as long as she's not married. That is completely false. So this is what false teachers do. They twist words and they twist the meaning and, and the context of everything. So how do we, uh, if we're going to study and and figure out what are these false teachings and these heresies, what do we got to do? Well, we cover that in season one, episode three, and here are some bullet points to sort of give you a refresher if you haven't heard it and you'd like to wait till afterwards, or if you have heard it and you just need a refresher. So number one, the word of God has the final say in all things. There is one God, one word, one doctrine. God never changes. God cannot lie, and his word will last forever. If we look at a verse in Matthew 24, 35 from Jesus, he says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. He is literally telling us that the word of God, his word, his words will not pass away, but heaven and earth shall. And so the word of God transcends space and time, and it will remain forever, so it has the final say in all things. But, okay, that's fine. What do we do when people twist it? All right, so that's point number two, that scripture interprets scripture. If we come to a particular conclusion when reading the Bible, we don't take that as the full meaning and just say, okay, this is what I think it means. I'm going somewhere else. Second Peter 1 verse 20 says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. We don't get to privately interpret the scripture. We cannot put our own meaning into scripture, but rather we use scripture to interpret scripture, which means if we think a part, one part of scripture indicates one thing, but we see other scriptures clearly indicating another thing, then we must accept that we are wrong in our understanding. You can't say, well, you know, this verse says this, and I acknowledge that it means this, and I acknowledge that that's the truth of it, and I can't reconcile my two different beliefs, so therefore, I don't know. I've seen very famous people, very trusted people do this, which we will cover perhaps in another video, say, well, I just, I can't reconcile them, but my belief is still correct. It's like, well, no, if, if what you believe and what you think a scripture is saying does not jive with other parts of scripture, then you have the incorrect understanding. Okay. So now how do we determine that? How do we determine what's right and what's wrong? That's the third point. And that context is key. When you're reading anything in the Bible, never take it in isolation. Read the surrounding text. Read the context of that chapter of the book and compare your understanding to the whole host of Scripture. You know, this is, uh, there's a few questions that you can ask. One question you can ask is, is this the same 
idea that an apostle espoused or the same apostle espoused in a different place or book, maybe earlier in the chapter, maybe earlier in the book, maybe in a different book, is this congruent with the overall theme and character of God and the prescriptions of Scripture? Not only this, but there's also things like narrative context, grammatical context, covenant context, such as whether what you're reading attains to the moral law of God or the ceremonial law of God, or even the civil law at the time, which also was regulated by God in the theocratic system. And one last thing that I'd like to add to this little blurb of the summary of season one, episode three, is that you got to be honest and humble. You got to rid yourself of pride, being willing to be utterly wrong in everything you think you know about scripture and doctrine. And you must let the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, lead you into all truth. Now, of course, there's more to biblical hermeneutics than this, but this is the gist of it. If you're interested in learning more, of course, I recommend listening to episode three of season one of our podcast. Now let's get into the nitty gritty, as Nacho Libre would put it, and define what exactly a heresy is and what a false teacher is, because there's a couple ways we can do this. Number one, we can look at the Greek and define the words from an etymological perspective. Number two, we can look at scripture to tell us what it is in plain speech. Or number three, we can do an internet search to see what men say all the heresies are and put our trust in them. Now, we're going to do the first two and not the third, because again, scripture has the final say, not men, nor any counsel outside of that which is scripture. Certain things, uh, certain teachings, including this one, can be helpful in our understanding by framing complex theological things, but they do not trump scripture. So let's take a look at the word heresies in the Greek, which is heresis. Now, you can go through and look at these dictionary aids. You can look at Vine's Expository Dictionary. If you have the theological uh, workbook of the New Testament, you can look up the page number. You can look at uh, all of these different dictionaries that you see here in front of you to get an understanding of it. Basically, the summary understanding of from all these different dictionaries is that it is a division or a dissension contrary to the truth of Scripture, which is established by the Bible through prescription and description. It is also a division or dissension that consists of one's own opinion or interpretation which is not congruent with scripture and specifically one opinion or interpretation that leads to a sect or quite literally a denomination. Now let's paint a picture on heresy. Scripture gives us further insight into how the word is used. In 1 Corinthians 11, 18 to 19, we see a section of scripture here where there are divisions that begin to manifest in the church of Corinth. They are present to show who is truly called of by God and who is not. The reason being for this is because those that are truly saved and are obedient to God do not make up new doctrines. They're not, oh, what can I figure out? What new thing can I come up with? They are instead interested in following and obeying the spirit of truth. So they teach what is correct and true according to God and his word. And because they have the spirit of truth and not the spirit of error, they're able to actually interpret the Bible correctly. You know, heresies, interestingly enough, according to the scripture, are a tool for the truly saved because they serve a purpose. And that purpose is to show before all who are truly saved and called of God to lead and who are not. It really is an amazing tool uh, that God uses to sharpen men uh, by getting them to stand up and resist these false teachings and preach the doctrines of the Bible. So let's read 1 Corinthians 11, 18 and 19. It says, For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. This word divisions here, this is the word schisma. It, it, it's our word for schism, separation. There, there's these dividing, there's the denominations forming. And he says, and I partly believe it. For there must also be heresies among you. There must be lies, things that are not true. There must be opinions and things that cause divisions and dissensions. There must be. Why must there be? Okay, well, he says that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Isn't that interesting? So it's a tool. It's a tool. Heresies are, are used as a tool by God because God allows for free will. And so people come up with their own weird opinions and they start teaching it and deforms these divisions in these sects. Well, those who are approved, both teachers and the laity and the average churchgoer or church attendee, there it shows who is out and those who are not following after the spirit of God and those who are because the heresies must exist to show the separation. The separation, the schism is actually necessary 
for those who are without. More on that perhaps in a different uh, podcast. Let's look at, take a look at also uh, Galatians 5, 19 to 21, which reads, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, same word, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and, uh, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Ooh, that's not good. That that's a that's a full ooh. You know, not inherit the kingdom of God if you're going to do any of these things, which includes heresies. Now, to understand how heresies are a work of the flesh and thus not of the spirit, and thus of someone who isn't saved, because the, the, it's through the flesh and not through the spirit. They're in the flesh. They will not inherit the kingdom of God because they haven't truly been converted they have not repented and believed so okay so let's let's try to understand how these things come about let me paint a picture a man thinks to himself in his own wicked heart how he thinks certain things should be he desires for the word of god to stretch to his understanding instead of being transformed and shaped by the word because he's destitute of the spirit of truth he says to himself ah i can connect the dots here here and here and make this make sense the man completely disregards the text rebuking him. He disregards the rebukes of godly men against him. He completely disregards what the Bible has been teaching forever, and he continues in his way, promoting what he thinks is true based solely on his own interpretation. This is what the path of a man who produces heresy looks like. It is selfish, self-willed, unrighteous, without a love for the truth in the word of God. It is truly someone who is in the flesh, and not in the spirit. And the worst part is he is entirely blind to it. The source of all of this is his own pride. And it is his pride which bars him from the truth and from the ability to truly repent and from his everlasting salvation. There is no mixing or mincing shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That is literally saying you're going to hell because you're still participating in all of these things, the heresies. Now, some people will say, well, this word heresies here means just causing division. Well, no, because we have verses that tell us to cause division over the truth, over doctrine. So this is not what that means. This means people that are uh, causing division themselves from the already established truth. Okay, let's move on. Now, it is important to paint a picture and explain what a heresy is and what a heresy isn't. Otherwise, one might misunderstand the concept and begin saying Anything that's an opinion is a heresy. Now, it's true that opinions are heresies, but only when they go against the doctrine of the Bible, and more specifically, when it leads to a sect or a group of beliefs that is against the Bible. Now, does that make anyone who teaches incorrectly a heretic? Well, there's some nuance here. Namely, a heresy espoused by someone might be due to a lack of knowledge, and they may not be a heretic and simply need to be corrected. However, it does indicate that that person is unfit to lead if they're espousing heresies because it indicates that they have a slew of things that might be wrong, such as pride or following denominational beliefs over the truth of scripture, or even simply not having the correct faculties to assess right or wrong. Uh, and in the worst case scenario, it might actually be that the person doesn't have the spirit of truth and instead the spirit of error. However, if they repent, although not currently fit to lead, they cannot be considered a heretic. So what makes someone a heretic? Well, we look directly to the Bible. We go to Titus 3.10, which tells us that a person becomes a heretic after they've been admonished the first and second time. So this is somebody that has been shown that they are wrong more than once. So you go and you sit down with them and you show them the scriptures and you show them how they're wrong. And they say, okay. And then they go away and then they come back and they're still espousing things. Okay, you do one more time and you say, okay, but this is, listen, man, you got this wrong. This is what the Bible says. And then they come back and they're still teaching heresy. You reject them. That's what it says. A man that is in a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Get him out of there. He's not fit to lead. He is, uh, has a spirit of error. More than likely isn't even saved because people that are saved follow God. To be saved, to be a Christian, is to be a Christ follower, to follow his word. And uh, someone that's saved wants to obey 
what the word of God says and they don't make up their own opinion and say, no, I, I actually believe I can be a wizard or whatever. So we are actually to reject individuals, whether they're pastors or whether they're just the regular person, deacon, doesn't matter who they are. If they are espousing heresy after they've been corrected twice, they are to be rejected. Now, a key distinction in this is that not every time someone offers a narrative explanation of things found in the Bible with their own semi-subjective opinion that it becomes a heresy. So let's define, because it is opinion, but what kind of opinion? Again, it's opinion that goes against the Bible. So let me paint an example. Let me paint a picture for you. For example, you can absolutely say Moses more than likely felt overwhelmed with the burden of having to judge all of Israel, which is partly why he conceded to Jethro's request and appointed 70 judges to ju of the nation of Israel in Exodus 18. And you can say that, and it's not a heresy. The reason why is, though the scripture itself does not explicitly express that Moses was extremely fatigued, it is reasonable to assume that he was, because we all know that Moses was just a man, and clearly Jethro remarked that Moses would wither away in the people of Israel with him. It was unsustainable for Moses to be judging all of Israel. So if Moses was not tired yet, he certainly would be soon. Now, making this statement is not a heresy because this is not speaking outside of what the Bible teaches of man, nor is it outside of the context of Scripture itself where Jethro pleads with Moses that the burden is too heavy for him. He says, Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Now, here's the thing. It's still just an opinion to say that Moses probably felt tired. We don't have an exact scriptural thing to say, yes, he felt tired at this moment. But again, it doesn't go against what the Bible is literally saying, that he's going to wither away and that we know about men, that we can, there's no way a man could judge all of a whole nation all by himself. That's why we have judges all over the place, because there's no way one person could do it. So let's move on to false teachers. So by now, you really should have a decent understanding of heresies and thus heretics and false teachers. But what does the Bible say about them? Well, interesting from an etymological perspective, the word used for false teachers in the Bible is pseudodidoskalos, which is two words in the Greek combined into one. The word pseudo, which is the same word that we use when we say, oh, something is pseudo this or it's pseudoscience. That, that word is the same word that we use today, and it means the exact same thing. It means deceiving or lying. Something is fake. Uh, it's not genuine. Uh, and the other word, which is didaskalos, this is the word pseudo here. So what it means, liar, false, deceitful. And didaskalos, which simply means teacher, teacher, doctor. <laughs> it means somebody that knows what they're talking about. So it's a false teacher, false teacher, somebody that is basically lying or manipulating, being deceitful, and they're teaching. So it's someone that is not teaching the correct doctrines of the Bible. That's a, that's a false teacher. So that's your definition of a false teacher. So now we're going to look at 2 Peter 2, which gives us literally zero room for false teachers. And there's actually a very serious eternal consequence for becoming a false teacher. And this, this we're going to go through this, but this passage of Scripture strongly indicates that this person has apostized and there is no salvation left for them, which is scary, which is why we really should, you know, in James 3, 1, it says, be not many masters. And that word masters there is teachers. Be not many teachers. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. My brethren, be not many didaskalos, masters, teachers, doctors, exact same word here, didaskalos. So let's read through Second uh, Peter 2 and exegete it a little bit. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. There's that word again. Let's check the word. Heresies, exact same word. Damnable heresies even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. 
and many shall follow their pernicious ways. Sounds a lot like today. You see the YouTube count numbers on our videos or other people that teach correctly. And then you see the YouTube count numbers on people that teach incorrectly. And it's like, oof, many do follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth, the correct doctrines shall be evil spoken of. No, that's not what it is. It's this. They're speaking evil of it. They're, they're saying it's a lie when, it, when it's not. It's the truth. They are the ones lying. And through covetousness, this is important. False teachers are covetous. They shall with feigned words, so fancy, fake, but empty words, make merchandise of you. And buy my book, buy my book, or whatever. They just, whatever they're doing, they're trying to sell you something. And it, it might actually be for their own financial gain, but it's also they're making merchandise of you. They're gaining from you. Look at this. This leaves zero room. Whose judgment, who gets judgment, by the way? Is it those who are believed or those who are unbelieved? Of course, we get the judgment of our works. But the judgment that it's speaking of here is not that judgment. Because look at this. It says, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sin. This is not talking about white throne judgment. This is talking about literal, literal hell, damnation. It slumbereth not. You're going to be a false teacher. This is the category you're going to put yourself in. This is what happens to you. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, God didn't spare the angels that sinned. He's like, oh, no, I'll, I'll save you. He didn't spare them, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, 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 and spared not the old world but save Noah, the eighth person. So the, everyone died except Noah and the, his sons and daughters, the eighth, eight people. That's it. He was a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes and condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample, which is our word example, unto those that after should live ungodly. You want to live ungodly? Look to Sodom and Gomorrah. You want to look, you want to live ungodly again, ungodly, look to Noah. You want to live ungodly, look to how God didn't, didn't spare the angels, but cast them into hell, into chains of darkness and delivered just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how, and this is, this is the whole portion for us that are saved, it says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So the godly, those who choose God and choose his word, choose his doctrine, choose to pursue him and pursue the right things and to live by the spirit of truth, God delivers us out of temptations. But to the unjust, he reserves them unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly that walk after the flesh. What did we just read? Remember Galatians 5.19. Remember this, that heresies was a work of the flesh in, in verse 20. Chiefly that them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. Hopefully the dots are connecting for you here. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Where angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not a railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, so there's, there's a whole thing to unpack here, what they're doing. And this, we'll, we'll cover this in more of our word of faith thing, but this is what's happening today. We see this a lot today. But these, as natural brute beasts, this is the Bible calling you a natural brute beast if you're a false teacher, false prophet, made to be taken and destroyed made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not. They don't understand what they're talking about. That's what I said earlier on. And they shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practice, cursed children, 
I've had some people say, but maybe they can be saved, though. I would like for you to show me in this chapter the room for that, because it is nothing but pure condemnation unto hell. There is no room. There's zero room. If you decide to become a false teacher, to teach falsely, to become a heretic, there is no salvation waiting for you. You see this in Hebrews 6. You know, the doctrine of once saved, always saved is true, but not the way that most people mean it. And there is another doctrine called once lost, always lost, which is a man who takes his plow is not fit for the kingdom of heaven, or takes his hand off the plow is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. In Hebrews 6, it says that it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away, apostatize, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain and come oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth a blessing from God, but that which beareth thorns, false teachers and briars, is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. Cursed children. Sheesh, this is heavy, isn't it? This is the Bible. This is the Bible. And this is what the Bible is teaching about being a false teacher. If you're going to teach incorrectly, this is your condemnation, which have forsaken the right way. They forsook it and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Man, this is just so many people today on the interwebs that a lot of so-called Christians are following. But Balaam was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. That's a donkey, by the way, in case you don't know. These are wells without water. These people, these false teachers, these false prophets, they're wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Where is salvation in that, right? The mist of darkness is reserved for you. Hell is reserved for you. Sheesh. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. Think about this. So many people that follow false teachers are there because of fleshly things, because of it makes them feel good, or there's friendship, or there's this, there's love. And it's not the true love of the Bible. It's, you know, this false sort of feel good love that isn't what the Bible defines as love. And through the lusts of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those who were clean escaped from them who live in error, those are the ones who are, are allured. The, the so-called saved. And these false teachers, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. It is better for you to remain an atheist than for you to so become a so-called Christian and then be become a false teacher. It is better for you to have never have known God. And you see this echoed in Revelations with the, it is better for you to be either cold or hot. And the lukewarm is really a reference to this. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. The Holy Commandment, the Word of God. Hello? Why has it happened? But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. It, the Proverbs. This is an actual proverb. It says, The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Returning to dirt, returning to vomit, returning to the evil way that they claim they forsook. And part of this is living in the flesh. There are many verses to consider when talking about false teachers. You know, you look at 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, which says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye received of us. 
And you look down here in verse 14, it says, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. There's so many other verses. We're only going to look at a few, but I'll leave the rest in the description. Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Brothers and sisters, let's do a little summary here. So what is a heretic? Well, it's somebody that, after the first and second admonition, is still continuing to preach things that are outside of the Bible. What is a heresy? It's anything that states itself to be true that is a lie because it's not in agreement to the Bible. Okay, so it's it's a, something, it, they're both compared to the Bible, a heretic and a heresy. A heretic is a person that espouses heresies that the heresies themselves are not in alignment with the Bible and the person is not in alignment with God and the Bible and they reject that after the second admonition, after the second time of going through that thing with them, if they still don't obey the word of God, they are a heretic. Those heretics may not end up becoming false teachers. They may just keep it to themselves and be a heretic till they die. A false teacher is then sort of like the evolution where that heretic then goes, okay, now I'm going to teach and I'm going to teach all of my heresies. And they form denominations, they form separations uh, and schisms throughout the so-called body of Christ. And I mean so-called because I think that there is a division between the true body of Christ, the wise and then the foolish virgins. Uh, even though the, the foolish virgins think they're part of the body of Christ, they're not. And so there is a division. Essentially, a false teacher is somebody who then goes and takes their heresies and can, in, in their pride continues to just preach it to everyone. Second Peter 2 makes it absolutely clear that that person is going to hell. And I, there is really no way around that. It is absolutely clear. And people have tried to argue this way or that way with that. I'm not the judge. But I would say that there are wheat and tares, as the Bible says. There are sheep and goats. There are wise and foolish virgins. And it is absolutely true that there are those who will teach things untrue and they will end up in hell. Who that is? Well, it's not for me to decide. It is up to God. In fact, the Bible tells us not to uh, try to pull up the tares with the wheat because sometimes somebody that looks like a tear, meaning they, they're starting to say things they should not, they end up becoming a wheat. They end up, that ends up resolving over time. I think it, it's different when someone then begins to stand behind a pulpit or make a YouTube video or whatever, and they begin to preach false heretical things. I think that is the dividing line which is why James 3 warns us. There's so many warnings in the Bible, and I think if anyone really loved God and read the Word, they would understand that these warnings are here for their own benefit so that they don't fall into these holes, these traps that people fall into. So in the next few episodes of this podcast, we're going to cover a variant amount of different heresies and false teachings. So stay tuned. You might not know which one we'll cover next. We have some ideas to cover the difference between Arminianism and and Calvinism and showing how uh, Calvinism and Arminianism are, are both wrong and they're right in some ways in certain aspects and certain perspectives and then they're wrong in other ways and try to pre present a balanced view that doesn't fall into the traps of either side. We also have ideas to cover a lot of the word of faith heresies that are out there but not just that any of the modern heresies that I think you guys are going to have to deal with throughout your lifetime, especially now that they're so prevalent on the internet. So stay tuned for that. Thanks again so much for being here and being part of this. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so on our website. Uh, if you'd like to support our work, you can also do it on our website. But hey, just subscribe, like the video, share it, uh, and be a part of our community online if you so wish to be. I hope this blessed you, and I pray that you would go and read your word, stay in your word, and obey it. Thanks for listening.